All righty. Well, thank you all so much for joining us today. We're so excited to have you here. Um, whether you are a first time participant in the Scholastic Awards or you are returning, we are so glad, so glad that you joined us tonight. We are going to be just walking through what the entry process to the Scholastic Awards looks like for you as educators and how you can best support your students through this process. Um, before we get started, we'll go ahead and introduce ourselves. My name is Katie Bonner. I work on the programs team here at the Alliance for Young Artists and Writers, which is the nonprofit organization that presents the Scholastic Awards. And I'm joined by my colleague, who I'll invite to introduce himself. Hi, everyone. My name is Christopher Denver, and I'm the Director of Operations for the Alliance for Young Artists and Writers. Thanks, Christopher. So before we get started, um, just a few housekeeping notes. First off, thanks to everyone who said hello. For all of our newcomers, please feel free to drop a line in the chat introducing yourselves. Um, for those of you who may be wondering, this session is being recorded. It will be shared on our YouTube channel uh, within the next week. So keep an eye on that if you want to refer back to anything from today's session. Closed captioning is available. You can turn that on through your Zoom screen. If you look at the um, bottom bar, you should see a more option and you can select captions there or show captions. And last but not least, we are collecting questions in the Q&A box today. Please do not drop your questions in the chat. They'll get lost in there. If you look in the bottom ribbon of your Zoom screen, you'll see a little feature that says Q&A. It looks like two little chat bubbles. Um, you can drop your questions in there. And if you see a question that somebody else asked that you're also interested in hearing the answer to, use the thumbs up to upvote that question. At the end of the session, we're going to have some time for Q&A, and we will prioritize questions with the most votes to make sure we get to the most popular questions tonight. Um, so please do skim through there to see if your question's already been asked, upvote it if it has. If not, drop your question in. Others may have the same question, and we'll get to as many of them as we can. So a quick overview of our agenda tonight. We started with our welcome. Um, we're going to jump into a little overview of what the Scholastic Awards are before we move into our tour of your Scholastic Awards account as educators. We'll close with a review of the resources available to you. And last but not least, we will turn it over to you for some questions before we close out for the night. And with that, we will go ahead and get started. About the Scholastic Art and Writing Awards. So the Scholastic Awards was founded just over 100 years ago now um, to celebrate creative youth around the country. The Scholastic Awards is the longest running and most prestigious scholarship and recognition program for teen artists and writers. And teens from around the United States and Canada are invited to apply. Um, in order to be eligible, you must be in grades seven through 12, age 13 and above, and you must reside or attend day school in the United States or Canada. Um, and that includes U.S. territories and U.S. military bases abroad. And of course, any art and writing that your students who meet those eligibility requirements are creating is welcome to be entered to the Scholastic Awards. There is an entry fee to participate in the awards. It costs $10 to enter an individual work and $30 to enter a portfolio. But fee waivers are available and easy to access through both your Scholastic Awards account and your student Scholastic Awards account. Um, and we encourage anyone who needs to use a fee waiver to check the box to do so. Teens can enter art and writing in 28 different categories. Uh, there is no limit on the number of works that can be entered. So if you have students who are multi-talented and who are um, exploring a bunch of different mediums and genres and maybe vacillating between art and writing, they are welcome to enter any and all of that work. We would love to see all of it from them. Um, so they can enter as many pieces as they want. However, they can only enter one piece in one category. So for example, if they created a piece of mixed media artwork and they're not sure, you know, it's a little bit 3D, does it fit in sculpture? Does it fit in mixed media? they will need to choose one category to enter in and that's certainly a place where you as an educator can be helpful. You can check out our website artandwriting.org for more information on categories and further descriptions to help them choose which category best fits their entry. Um, but they can again enter that single work only once in one category, but they can enter as many works as they want in as many categories as they want. The one exception to that is photography, where um, an individual can only enter up to 16 photography entries. 
and art portfolio categories. Seniors are invited to enter up to two art portfolios and two writing portfolios. Each portfolio consists of six individual pieces, and those pieces can be entered as individual entries as well as part of the portfolio. All works entered to the Scholastic Awards are judged by our tremendous group of jurors around the country at both the regional and the national level. At the regional level, works are considered for honorable mention, silver key, and gold key awards. And gold key works go on to be considered for national medals, um, which include silver medals and gold medals, as well as scholarships. All work at every level of judging is judged on the same three criteria, originality, skill, and emergence of a personal voice or vision. So something to keep in mind as you're helping your students think about which pieces to enter, while skill is important and we want to see what skills they're demonstrating, it is not the only factor being considered. We really want to see work that demonstrates their uniqueness and their creativity and their perspective, their unique perspective of the world and their vision for what they're creating in it. Um, and all of our judges know nothing about the teams whose work they're seeing, so all entries are judged anonymously. And the Scholastic Awards as an entity values freedom of expression. So there's no limit on the content that can be covered in your students' entries. Um, we do have a number of scholarships and cash awards available through the Scholastic Awards to both your students and to you as educators. Um, so some of our most prestigious awards include the Gold Medal Portfolio Award, which offers $12,500 to teens around the country and an award for the educators credited on each of those portfolio entries, which is $1,000. Similarly, we have a Silver Medal Portfolio Award. Um, we have a New York Life Award sponsored by the New York Life Foundation, which awards works in any category uh, that are talking about personal loss, grief, and bereavement. And if your student wins that award, they will receive a $2,500 scholarship. If you, as their educator, are credited on their entry, you will see, receive a $500 award. And last but not least, we have our Herb Block Award for Editorial Cartoons. That is, of course, for um, works entered into the editorial cartoon um, category. And sponsored by the Herb Block Foundation, this award offers $2,000 to teens and $500 to the educator credited on their entry. We have a few more tuition and scholarship opportunities available to your students. Uh, we have a Scholastic Award Summer Scholarship Program, which offers funding for a select group of students to attend a summer program uh, related to art or writing. And we also have partners, partnerships with colleges and universities around the country that offer merit-based scholarships to Scholastic Award winners. So a tremendous opportunity for some of your high school students, especially 11th and 12th graders. Um, our partners look every year at the list of national medalists and some partners look at the list of regional award winners in their area to determine who from their applicant pool will be receiving a scholarship based on merit. Um, and we also have for educators, Blick gift certificates for all educators credited on gold and silver medal artworks. Additionally, we have special $500 certificates given to a select group of five educators each year. And of course, we have a writer's retreat for educators credited on writing entries. Um, the application for that opens after regional awards are announced in January. So if you're accredited on an entry, you are then invited to apply for this writer's retreat if you are a teacher with your own writing practice and you're interested in that. If you want to learn more, again, you can check out our website at artandwriting.org. Each of these scholarships goes into detail on there, and you can look at some of the other parameters for applying. Um, but something to note is that all of these opportunities happen first through entering the Scholastic Awards. So before anything, your students should get started by creating their accounts at artandwriting.org, getting permission from their parent or guardian to sign up. Um, that is done over email. When they create their account, an email will be generated to their parent or guardian to sign off on their participation, and then uploading their original work and either paying for or fee waiving their entry fees. Um, deadlines vary by region starting as early as December 1st, and we'll take a look at how you can find your regional deadline a little bit later on tonight. But again, all of those scholarship opportunities that we talked about are available by first entering the Scholastic Awards. And we'll take a look at how you can indicate that you're interested in some of these scholarships a little bit later on. Uh, but most of them, all students are automatically considered for by participating. 
And now it is time for the meat of today's session, what you've all been waiting for, actually taking a look at the entry portal where you and your students will be participating this year. So to get started, let's talk about why you might be interested in creating an educator account. For those of you who have worked with us in the past, um, this was an optional step. However, with the launch of our new entry portal, uh, this is now a requirement. So in order to be credited on your student's entry, you must create an educator account. The reason for this is that we want to make sure that we have accurate information about you if one of your students is going to list you on their entries, and because we want to make sure that you have the option to indicate that you are not interested in being listed on their entry if um, you may have been listed at by mistake or it may be a work that you're not involved with. So first and foremost, you wanna create an account so that your students can credit you on their entries so that you can gain access to all the opportunities available and so that you can manage their entries and manage your relationship to their entries. Um, you also want to create an account so that come regional announcement period when all of our regional awards are announced and then a little bit later when our national awards are announced, you can actually log into your account and see if your students won an award. Um, so it's a great way for you to be able to experience the program with them and really know what they're celebrating when they're celebrating. So to get started, we invite you to visit artinwriting.org and click the login button to create your account. You'll click create an account here and then select I am an educator. As you can imagine, when your students go through this process, they'll just click this I'm a teen button here, and they'll be taken through a very similar setup journey. Um, the options when they get through the setup journey will look a little bit different, but we'll share some resources so that you can better understand what that looks like. Once you click this link and start creating your account, you'll be taken to this page here where you'll be prompted to put in basic information about yourselves. First and foremost, you'll be asked to set a password and put in an email address. This email address will be your username to your account. It needs to be different from any other um, accounts you may have created with us. So if you created an account in our old system, you can use that email address again. If you've already created an account in this system and you need a second account for some reason, you will be prompted to use a different email address. So it must be unique and it must be a functioning email address. If you ever forget your password, um, you will need to be able to receive emails from us at that address in order to reset your password and gain access to your account again. So use an email where you can get emails from us and be sure to use a password that you'll remember um, or that you can save somewhere. I know that for those of you who are in schools, you may have really tough firewalls where you can't necessarily get emails from outside sources. Um, including some of our emails. If that's the case, you can use a personal email to set up your account. Your students will at no point in their journey see the email address that you've input into your account here. So feel free to use whatever email address is best for you. Once you have gotten through all of that information, you'll click this create your account button to be taken to your dashboard. But before we get into that, I wanna talk a little bit about how you and your students will be assigned to your regional programs. Now, I mentioned earlier that deadlines vary by region. We have a number of regional programs around the country, and those are the first step to your participation in the Scholastic Awards. All works are judged at a regional level before the highest awarded regional works go on to be considered for national awards. Um, so it's really important that you connect with the region in your area. When teens create an account, they are assigned to regions based on their school zip code. If you work with homeschooled students, they will be assigned to a region based on their home school, uh, excuse me, their home zip code, because they will indicate that they're homeschooled in their setup journey. As an educator, you are also assigned to regions based on your school zip code. So if you are um, a homeschool educator, you will be assigned to a region based on your home zip code. Um, and if you work in an out of school program called an other educational program in the system, such as an after school program or a summer program, and let's say you don't work in a school at all, that's no problem. You'll be assigned to a region based on the zip code of your program. Something to note is that in order for your students to find your accounts later, you do need to be in the same region as them. So if you are a homeschool teacher, or if let's say you teach a summer program with boarding students who attend a school in another state, you may be located in different regions from your students. You can check your region by visiting artinwriting.org and clicking the My Region link. 
Um, please note that that page is temporarily down, but it will be fixed very, very soon. So when you visit tonight, it won't necessarily load, but if you visit in two days, it'll pop up and you can put in your zip code there and search for your region. Um, but if you are in one of those two positions, you may wanna create your account using your student's home zip code or your student's school zip code to ensure that you get placed in the same region as them. And if you have any questions about that process, you can check out our FAQ on the website for more information or use the contact us form to reach out and one of our staff members can help walk you through that process. But for most of you, if you are um, in the same school as your students or in the same geographic location in another educational program or a homeschool, just create your account using your information and you will automatically be linked to the same region as your students. Once you log into your account, you'll see that you don't have any um, students listed in it if you just created your account tonight. That is because your students first need to connect you to their account before you can see them. So in order to connect to your student's account, you need to one, of course, create your account. Two, make sure that you are um, listing the same school and or other educational program as your student in your profile. So if you work with your schools at the example that we'll be using later, um, Nanuet Senior High School, you'll want to make sure that all of your students properly register to the same high school that you work with them at in order for you to connect. If, say, I am an after-school program teacher at um, Right With Us USA, I'll want to make sure that all of my students put Right With Us USA in their profile so that they can easily find me when it comes time to upload their work. And we'll take a look in a minute at what that looks like. And last but not least, in order for you to be able to access your students' entries, they need to credit you on those entries. So when they go through the process of uploading a work, they'll see an option to select where they made their entry, either in their school or in their other educational program. And then they'll see this drop down here when they can select which educator they worked with. So if I am Professor Awards from Nanuet High School, uh, my teacher, my I may instruct my students to say, Yes, we made this painting in class. Please select that you made your painting at school and select me as the educator. And many of them will know to do that without your instruction. There is an option down here for students to indicate that they created the work independently. So if there's a work that you're not comfortable being credited on, you can always check that box and say that you didn't have any, anything to do with the work and you won't be listed on any credits to do with the work later. Um, as far as we're concerned, regardless of the content, the team can and should still enter that work because we have um, no limitations on content. We value freedom of expression. But again, if you are not comfortable being credited on a work for any reason, whether it be that you don't feel um, that it was made under your purview, so you don't want to be responsible for the content or because it's content that maybe you're not comfortable with, that is totally okay. Just check that box that your student created the work independently and it will no longer be linked to you. And it actually will no longer be visible in your account. So now we are going to change up our screen share for a moment and actually take a tour of what your accounts look like. So I am logged in as Professor Awards right now. And there's a few things that I wanna point out to you. When you first log into your dashboard, you're going to see these counts up here. This is where you can get a quick look at who is participating, from your school that you've been credited on a work for or from your organization. Um, so my account has been active for a bit. I've gotten some of my students to create their accounts and log in. So I can already see some works that I've been credited on, the number of student accounts that I'm connected with, and the school or other educational program that I'm connected with. I can also see my deadline here and I can edit my profile information um, by visiting these links on the left here. If I need to change my password or the email address associated with my account, I can click my initials in the top right corner and select that here. Now, very importantly, in the top left of your corner here, you'll see this choose your region option. You're, you have um, two regions, no matter where you're located. Everyone has an art region and a writing region. So basically, when you click this drop down, you are selecting if you want to see your art entries or your writing entries. So as Professor Awards, I happen to teach both art and writing. So I've been credited on a couple of writing entries and a few art entries. And I can switch back and forth between my art region and my writing region here and see, again, the number of works, the number of participants, the number of organizations that I'm connected through for my writing entries versus my art entries. I'll also see this deadline change 
You and your students may have the same deadline for your art entries and your writing entries, but you may have different deadlines. So be sure to check both your art region and your writing region and check those deadlines there before you get started. Um, and if you're ever looking for a participant or a work and you're not seeing it in your account and you know that you should be, my first tip is to always check that you're in the correct region. If I know I'm looking for a photography entry, I wanna go here and double, triple check that I am in my art region. And you'll know because it will always say art in it. Or if I'm looking for a poetry entry that I know I should be credited on, I know I should see, I wanna go here and double check that I'm in my writing region. Now in your main dashboard here, we have these quick views at, up top where you can see a basic overview of the participation that you're connected with. You can also see the status of the entries that you're credited on. So down here, we have our incomplete entries. Um, you will see any entry that you have been credited on that one of your students has started to make, but that might be missing most of the information. So for example, if your student started an entry, but they didn't actually upload the picture of their artwork, that will fall under this category here. If they started the entry and they uploaded the picture, but they haven't gone through and double checked the information yet and um, signed off on their participation terms, that will show up here. If your students have done everything except for paying or fee waiving their entry fees, that will show up in this not paid category here. And we'll take a look in a moment at how you can manage that and possibly make payments yourself. And last but not least, you have this ready for judging bucket. This is where you can see all of the works that have been uploaded. The parent or guardian has given permission for their student to participate. The info about the work has been inputted into the system and the entry has been paid for or fee waived. Those entries are ready for judging and those will appear here. You'll wanna make sure that all of your entries are in this green bucket by your deadline. Um, most deadlines are at midnight on the day of the deadline, but not all of them. So be sure to check here as it gets closer to see what time the deadline is that day in your region. Um, and if you have any outstanding issues with your region, or excuse me, with your payment, for example, and the deadline's coming, but you're planning to get the payment in, um, feel free to reach out to your regional program and they can help make sure that those works are judged even if you need, let's say, a day to get a check from your school um, to make sure that your, entry, your students' entries are paid for. But again, our goal is to have everything in this ready for judging category by the time that the deadline hits. And if I were to switch back over to my art region here, I can see that one of my students' entries has already been paid for, two of them have not been paid for, and I'm credited right now on zero entries where um, they haven't uploaded their work at all. So now let's get into some of the ways that you can actually manage the entries in your region. First and foremost, you can message your students from here and they will actually get a message in their account. Um, they have a similar icon and place as this where they will see a little red number sign if they have a new message. So if let's say you know that your students are logging into their account later that day, you might wanna message everybody with an incomplete entry. Um, and just give them some next steps and instructions for them to complete their entry as soon as they log in. And you'll know that when they log in, they'll see a notice in their account here with a message. Now you yourselves may receive messages, not from your students, they do not have the ability to message you through the system, but you'll see messages from us at the Alliance and from the um, regional program that you're entering through that may have some information about the next steps that you or your students need to take to help them complete their entries. Um, so be sure to check your message center here. And again, when you have new messages, there'll be a little number highlighting that right next to them. So now let's go back to our dashboard here. We can search for the works that were credited on using a few different criteria up here. It so happens that I'm credited on few enough works that I don't actually have to search that. I can just see a list of them and take my actions from this page. You can also, from your dashboard, go and search for participants, and you can look for all of the students who have credited you on an entry. If you have a student who you know made an account but hasn't uploaded any work yet, you may not see them here. That's okay. Once they start their first entry, they should credit you on it so that you can then see them and their work from your account. So again, you only see here participants who have credited you on an entry and you only see the works that you've been credited on. 
Now, let's say you want to manage some of these entries and help get them through the final steps to judging. Um, in most cases, that means payment. In some cases, that might mean actually editing the works yourself. So from this not paid section, you can click the pay button to choose how you want to pay for your students' entries. However, most of your work management will happen from this work page here. Here you can view the entries. You can actually edit some of the information about the work. So let's say this isn't a town, this is a city. Um, you can go ahead and make that edit on your student's behalf. You can view the image that they uploaded. You can edit the description of their work. You can edit their sources, make sure that they have properly cited any sources um, for their entry. You can see how they've selected you as the educator. And you can again message them and manage their payment through here. And if you do not want to be credited on an entry, again, you can see that information down here. You can change the school or the program that they use to create their entry, which will remove you from the entry. Or you can ask them to simply go in and edit you as the educator and check that box to say that they created the work on their own. Uh, now, again, most of, I think, the action items that you'll be taking on near complete entries will be to manage the payments. In every region, you can pay for your students' entries by credit card or select to use a fee waiver for them. Teens also have the option to pay by credit card or use a fee waiver from all of their accounts. In some regions, you'll also see an option to pay by cash or check for each entry. This will generate a PDF form with that entry that your team can put in an account, excuse me, fold up and put in an envelope with say the $10 that they wanna mail in for their entry. Um, if this option is enabled in your region, which again, it isn't in all regions, that should be used only if you are um, printing the forms for your teens to pay for the works themselves. If you as the educator or your school or organization is paying for multiple entries, then you should use this invoice option here. What this does is allow you to generate an invoice where you can say who from your school is paying. So administrator Katie is paying for this work. Um, I can make a little note on it. Hi, Katie, please pay for this. And I can put in our payer's email address. When I click save, oops. well, I did something wrong here, but when I click save, it should generate an invoice. Um, that you can then print out and again, mail in with the check for your program. Uh, once you have your invoice generated, you can see all of your invoices here. So let's say that you wanted to do one invoice per class. You could separate out the entries by your morning class and your afternoon class and submit a separate invoice for each of those batches of works. From your students' accounts, it will look like their entry has been paid. And um, in terms of communicating with the regional partner who are man who's managing your entries, um, you can just mail in the invoice with your check and they will know to match it to your payments, excuse me, to match it to your students' entries and indicate that the invoice has been received so that you can see that from your account. But again, that is not enabled in every region. In every region, you can pay by credit card or by fee waiver. And we can actually change those right now to fee waiver so that you can see how they move. Whoops, that did not save. Well, I will say I'm using our test site tonight and it's a little bit buggy. In your accounts, if you were to do that with your entries, you would see how those entries, oh, there they go, how they move seamlessly, perhaps with a slight pause, um, from the not paid section to the ready for judging section up here. Again, I'm using our test site so everything doesn't flow exactly as it does in your account, um, but this is a um, pretty similar look and feel, almost exact look and feel, and a pretty similar flow to what you'll experience in your accounts. So that does it for our tour of our accounts. So just a reminder of some resources available to you as you support your students' entries. 
Um, on YouTube, we have two instructional video, two playlists of instructional videos that walk through what your students' accounts look like, so the teen experience with the Scholastic Awards, and another set of videos that walk through what your accounts look like as educators and everything that you can do in your profiles. Um, if you visit artandwriting.org and go to our classroom guides page, you'll see a number of resources there as well that you can use in class with your students. So for example, you'll see a worksheet that you can send home with them where they can put in all of the information that they need to create their accounts. For example, if you wanted them to create their accounts in class, um, you'll find a checklist for yourselves where you can keep track of which of your students are entering and where they're at in the entry process. Um, and you'll also see a slide deck that you can use in your class or session with students um, if you want to help walk them through the entry process. And with that, I will turn it over to you. Uh, Christopher, do we have any questions? We do. We have a number. There's some that I've answered as we've gone along, <clears throat> but I'll just work my way down the list based on the upvotes uh, and throw them to you, Katie. Great, thank you. Our top question right now is, do teachers have a way to create an entry for a student? That is a great question. Teachers do not have a way to create an entry for a student. So as an educator, you can help your students manage their work after they've created the entry, but at the very, very least, they need to first uh, start the entry themselves. And by starting an entry, they don't even have to upload the work, but they simply need to log into their account and click upload art or upload writing, and they'll put in a title for their work and click save. And there's some basic information on that page. Once they click save, that will allow them to credit you on the work and you can um, manage the work from your account from there. So if you wanted to get them started by having them start an entry, add a new entry, upload a work, um, and just put in the title and credit you as the educator, that is the only step that they need to to complete before you can take over and actually upload images or copy and paste and writing on their behalf. Great, thank you. Uh, our next top question is uh, not seeing students in the system or being able to view their uh, their works. So thinking that the student it has definitely created their account, but not necessarily finding that connection. Got it, thank you. So, um, that may be because you are either not in the same region as your student. That would be, I would say, the most, um, probably the, the least likely case. It, it definitely happens, especially if you work in an other educational program that's not physically located in the same places where your student lives, or if you are a virtual school teacher and your students, um, you know, live elsewhere. Um, that may be the case. However, in most cases, I think it is probably because the student has not credited you on an entry. So as long as you have your account created and your student has their account created, they need to first start uploading their work so that they can credit you on an entry. And you know what, I'm actually just going to pull up a student account very quickly so that we can take a look at that flow together um, because I think it is worth seeing what it looks like from the student perspective so that you know how to help walk them through that process. So I am now logged in here, oops, logged in here as a student, um, one of Professor Award's students. When your students are in their account, they'll click this add work button and this is the bare minimum information that they need to put in to be able to credit you so that you can now see them in your account and see their entries again you won't see your student in their in your account unless they've credited you on an entry so i will start my test work here let's say i'm doing a sculpture i don't even have to put in all that information and i want to select professor awards and i can just click save and close here and now if I were to log in as Professor Awards, I can see this work and I will see this student in my list of students. If you walk through that process with your student and they still are not showing up in your account, please reach out to us using our contact form at artandwriting.org slash contact us, uh, which I'm dropping in the chat here, and we can help walk you through that. All right, thanks. Our next top question is about uh, receiving a fee waiver. So as uh, you saw in the work entry and upload process, um, when they get to the screen where they can select a credit card or 
there is a, a, a button or a, uh, an option to, to indicate a fee, fee waiver and they check the box that they certify that they uh, meet the response or the criteria for that and they can simply push their work through and the, the steps are done for them. So it's a seamless and easy process. Yeah, and I would say it's just as easy from your students' accounts. Let's see. Next question was uh, centered around par parental permission. So students who have up uploaded works and believe that their parent has uh, indicated their permission, uh, but the educator has not seen that the permission seems to be granted. Okay, um, that is a great question. So there is an option from your account to resend the verification email to any in any situation where the parent or guardian has not given their approval yet. So if you're seeing it, it may be that the parent or guardian clicked the toggles, but didn't actually hit to confirm or submit their approval. So maybe they think that they did it, but they didn't quite do it yet. Um, in that case, you can use a button that will appear in your dashboard um, from that view that we were looking at earlier. Let me see if I should log back in here. Um, from that view that you're looking at earlier, you'll see that there is a button to resend the verification to parents or guardians who are missing parent permission. Um, oh, goodness, I don't have anybody missing parent permission in this account. Um, but you can use that button to prompt them to put in their parent permission, and then you should see it show up in your work dashboard. Um, if that is still not the case, please do contact us and we can help look into that for you. But it may just be an issue of resending it and making sure that they scroll down all the way to the bottom of the page when they click through to accept all of the permissions. The email will take them to, there's a button that they click in the email and that takes them to another page where they then need to click, I think it's two toggles and one yellow button to move forward. Great, thank you. Uh, as it relates to crediting the educator, um, if the student has uh, uploaded their work and paid for it, so the work is ready for judging, uh, if the student is still able, able to go in and uh, credit their educator, if that's available up through the deadline? Uh, yes, that's a great question. Students can change their educator credit at any time on their entry before the deadline. So even if they've paid for the work, they can go in and still click edit, add you as the educator, or if you were already added as the educator and you shouldn't be, they can click edit and remove you as the educator. Okay. <clears throat> uh, we have a question around uh, accessibility in other languages uh, in the future. Um, I will say just at a, the highest level, we are certainly taking in all feedback that we receive throughout the program year as it relates to the system itself or the program as a whole. Uh, and in the future, have uh, definitely will look at additional ways to make the system uh, accessible, whether that's from uh, visual impairments or languages or things like that. So um, nothing on the, the horizon for this current program year, but definitely something that we're logging and, and we'll closely evaluate for the future. Let's see. Uh, yes, just clarification around the parental permission. So um, there is no paper form. Uh, the parent will receive an email indicating that the student is requesting permission to enter their work. The parent receives the email, clicks the link inside of it, uh, indicates that they are granting their permission, and then that is done. So no more paper forms, no more printing and scanning and mailing and all of those things that we had in the past. Yes, it is happily virtual and seamless now. Let's see. Sorry, let me just get through the list here. Just clarifying that can students enter one work only in each category or more than one work in each category? Um, thank you for checking. I'm sorry if I said that confusingly earlier. To clarify, students can enter more than one work in each category, but they can only enter the same work once. They can't enter the same work in multiple categories. So a student can enter, um, you know, 10 poems, eight paintings, eight photos, and 50 critical essays. But if they have a piece that's both humorous and a critical essay, 
they can't enter the same piece in humor and critical essay. They have to pick one category. In the same vein, um, an educator who's always been on the fence about encouraging students to enter their work as a portfolio rather than individual works, are there advantages or disadvantages to either approach? Uh, that's a really great question. I would say that um, there is no disadvantage to doing both. Works can be entered both as individual entries and as part of a portfolio. The advantage of entering as a portfolio is that there are these scholarships available for portfolio entries. So if your student does win the highest level of portfolio award, um, they could be eligible for a scholarship up to $12,500, which is a pretty huge win um, for them if they are receiving that top award. And if they win a portfolio award, regardless of whether or not they do, the individual pieces of their portfolio can still receive high level awards or any awards as individual entries. So I would say that there's no downside to doing both and it just opens them up to more opportunities to be recognized. Christopher, I don't know if you have anything to add. No, nothing additional, thank you for that. Uh, zooming all the way back to the account creation, going back to students in different regions, just clarifying that uh, different accounts would need to be linked to each of those individual regions. Uh, and then the presenting the challenges of creating multiple email addresses. Um, one best practice that we found is if you, uh, if your school or you utilize uh, Google, Gmail, or anything within that, uh, which many companies or schools use that as their basis, uh, there is a best practice that you are able to use whatever your, the start of your email address is, and then put the plus sign, and then you can add any words after that. Uh, and it essentially is like creating a unique email address to the system, but it is still just your one email account. So um, if you utilize a Gmail type account, you are able to do that to make things a little easier. Um, if you do not, then having uh, uh, unique email addresses to link to each of the regions. And Katie just put into the chat an example of what uh, that Gmail address could look like. And I'll say, you know, during our testing and in preparation for launching this year, we've all used that a lot and it works great for us. Let's see. Uh, can more than one teacher get credit on a work? That is a really good question. So only one teacher can be credited on a single entry. If you are co-teaching or in a class with uh, multiple teachers, then there's no perfect way to credit both of you on the entry. Um, we would suggest choosing the lead teacher, the teacher who is most involved in helping that student through the entry process or in the creation of their work, or perhaps having the student divide up which works are credited to which teacher, but only one teacher can be credited on one entry. Okay, thank you. I'm right, just scrolling through to see what we haven't discussed already. While you're looking through there, Christopher, I just want to call out, I've seen some folks drop in the chat that they've um, reached out to us but haven't heard back yet. I do want to acknowledge that we have a high volume of customer service inquiries right now, and we have not been able to get back to folks um, in our usual turnaround. So we really appreciate your patience. We do encourage you to continue reaching out to us with specific questions using our contact us form, which I'll drop in the chat now, that is still the best way to reach us. We do have folks who are monitoring that inbox and they will be getting back to you there. Um, however, it's just with a bit of a delay, but please rest assured that you'll hear from us before your students' entry deadline. We also have some events coming up um, that are Zoom meetings. They're called our live Q&As, where it's really just a chance to meet one-on-one -on -one with a staff member who can spend time on Zoom with you about an individual issue that you're having. So I'll drop the link to register for our first live Q&A in the chat here in just a moment. And we definitely encourage you to join if you have any outstanding questions at that point. And I'll hand it back over to you, Christopher. Thank you. Uh, can a student create an account from February to June and upload work as that is when they work with, when this educator works with students? Yes, that is a great question. They absolutely can. The works entered this year do not have to be created in this school year. It can be anything created um, 
that hasn't been entered in the Scholastic Awards before. So if you have students from last spring or the summer who were creating work, yes, they can absolutely enter that. Um, however, when they make their account, they should list their current grade level. And once the uh, season deadlines uh, have occurred and we are in regional and national judging, then we would not be creating any new accounts within this current program year, correct? Yes. Great. And I just dropped the link in the chat to our first live Q&A, where again, we'll be able to meet with folks one-on-one -on -one in the Zoom room. So if you have outstanding questions and you want to register for that, please go ahead and do so. We'd be happy to help you there. Our first session is on October 30th. Uh, let's see. I have a student who wants to enter a painting in the art category, but I'm not her art teacher. Should she just enter on her own and not link to a teacher account? That is a great question. Um, I would say that the answer depends a little bit on your relationship to the student. You don't have to be, if you work with them at the same school or organization, you can be credited on the entry if you're working with them on it, or if it would be helpful for them to have you credited so that you can help them through the entry process. Um, if they feel comfortable at entering with their art teacher support, then they can certainly talk to their art teacher and credit them on the entry. If they feel like they created the work on their own, if they created the work outside of their art class, um, then they, they don't need to credit anyone on it. It's certainly appropriate for them to check that box that said I created the work independently. Uh, one popular question is, uh, if we could perhaps give a brief uh, view of what the teen facing side of the system looks like. Yes, absolutely. Oh, yeah. let me just log back into our teens account here. While you do that, I'll look through the questions to see if there's any unique ones uh, that we can touch on here. Thank you. And I will pull this up for us. Okay, if we're ready, Christopher, I can jump into a little tour of this here. Yes, please do. That'd be great. Okay, absolutely. Um, so thank you for this question. Your teens will see when they log in and create their account, which again, the journey for that looks very similar to what you saw, they'll be taken to this page here. Now we're logged into an account that already has some entries, but this dashboard area will be blank when your students first log in um, and they will be able to add a work. If your student is a senior in high school in 12th grade, they'll see an add work and an add portfolio button here. But right now we're logged in as an 11th grader. So we only see add work. Now. From their account, they'll see all of the works that they entered. They'll see their art and writing deadlines. They'll see the names of their regions and they'll be able to see and edit their information here. And similar to you, change their passport, uh, password or email address here. Um, they can contact customer support using this link as you can from your accounts. And they can also edit the school or program that they're connected to. Now, Oh, and I'm sorry, last thing, they can see their messages. So if you message them, this is where it will show up. This number will change to a one and they'll see any new messages from you here. Um, now let's go ahead and actually upload a work as one of our teams. So let's say that Harry is interested in some photography today. So Harry is going to be uploading a photograph and we'll say that this is a picture I took. Um, your students will, of course, do a much better job summarizing their work than I can here. Um, but now that we have put that information in, you'll see the area where we can select where the student created their work at school or at their other educational program. You'll see that your students can actually add additional other educational programs. So let's say that they go to school with you and then they have another teacher in there. You know, they do a writing after school program and they went to an art camp over the summer, they can add all three of those things to their profile and be connected to their educators from all three of those programs. Um, not on the same entry, but on different entries in their account, they can be connected to all of you. So 
In this case, our student currently only attends one after school program, um, but maybe they are doing a summer program this year in New York City as well. And they can add both of those to their profile. So this step is important when they're looking to credit their educator. They need to make sure that they've selected the right program where they created their work and where you teach in order for them to see your account. So um, let's say that I am Harry and I think I need this work at Mind the Gap, but I go and look and I actually am not seeing my educator here, Professor Awards. I'll go back up and I'll look and I'm like, oh yeah, no, Professor Awards is my teacher in school uh, every day. So now you can see that Professor Awards is the teacher that you want to select and Professor Awards showed up in that list now that I've selected the same school that Professor Awards works at rather than just my summer program. And now I can save and continue on to the next step here and upload my artwork. Um, so your students will see a list of instructions about the information that they should provide for this category. Uh, for any entries in this category, they'll be prompted to put in the dimensions of their work, any tools that they used. Um, as you can see, I am not a photographer, so I don't know about the tools so well. Um, then they can actually drag and drop in the image that they want to share here. And you'll see that the file's been added. Now they'll be prompted to list their sources. Um, copyright and plagiarism is an important step of our review process during adjudications. We need to make sure that every work properly cites its sources and that each work is truly unique and original created by the student. So let's say that this student did reference the work of another artist. They'll answer yes to this question here and they'll be prompted to either put in a link to that artist or reference the artist that they um, reference them by name. Either would suffice. If they use more than one source, they could click this button here and then add in their second source that they used. And they can answer these additional questions appropriately for their work. When you're finished here, click Save and Continue. And that will take you to the Cash Awards page. This is where you can opt into any of the thematic scholarships that we mentioned earlier. So there's no separate application process for that. You just indicate um, if your work fits the description for this award, and if so, you'll be prompted to put in a personal statement. And if not, you just cl simply click Save and Continue. And now you'll be taken to the final page as your student where you can review all of your entry information. You'll be asked to read the copyright and plagiarism policy and the participation terms, confirm that they have read and understand them, and then click Enter for judging. They'll always be prompted, they'll always be asked if they want to pay for their entry now or pay later. Um, most of the time, they'll probably click pay later if they want to enter more than one work. But let's say right now your student wants to pay right now. Um, as you can see, they can't upload this sculpture work that we started earlier because, or excuse me, they can't pay for it because there's no work uploaded for it. Um, but they can pay for their other entries that haven't already been paid for. Um, they can select multiple entries or a single entry and then they can choose how they want to pay. Or if they want to use a fee waiver, they check this box here and just click certify. And now that work is fee waived and considered paid and entered for judging. And when they go back out to their dashboard, they'll see that everything for, oh, this was our new entry. Everything for this entry has been completed. All of these check marks indicate that it is ready to go into judging. That was a super quick tour, um, but that is, exactly what the process will look like from your students' accounts. And I see now that we are at the end of our time together. So I'm going to pull back up our PowerPoint here. Um, unfortunately, we do not have time to get to any more questions tonight. So I would again ask that if we didn't get to your question, please do feel free to shoot us a message using the contact us form on our website. Um, and we invite you to stop by some future events for um, additional support throughout the entry season and possibly some inspiration. Um, so we have a webinar, a webinar coming up this Thursday for your students. It is a webinar about how to navigate their accounts as teens and what the entry process looks like from their perspective. This webinar is free and open to all. So you as educators are welcome to join us again there. Although again, it will predominantly be focused on your students' experience. Um, 
We have more virtual events coming up this fall, including some um, writing workshops about works related to personal grief and loss and a panel with Scholastic Awards jurors. So keep an eye on our blog, um, which Christopher is dropping in the chat um, June. Um, thank you, Christopher, uh, for updates on other upcoming events. And of course, to get started with Scholastic Awards entries, please visit artandwriting.org and click login to create your account today. Deadlines do vary by region starting December 1st. So once you create your account, you'll be able to see the entry deadlines for your students' art and writing regions and help manage them to those deadlines. And last but not least, if you do enter the Scholastic Award this year, we are very excited to share that regional awards will be announced and visible from your accounts on January 26th. So save the date. We're excited to see you back then. Um, thank you all so, so much for joining us tonight. We are so grateful for you to you for being such constant sources of support for your students um, and so grateful for you for helping them participate in the Scholastic Awards. We love to see all the works that they make every year. So thank you to all of you for your time. We hope to see your students' entry soon and we hope you have an absolutely lovely evening. Thank you so much, everyone. Goodbye. Thanks, everyone.